you start early in the morning and you finish after you on a Friday. So I hope you value the fact that I'm going to build a company for overtime today. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for giving up your Friday afternoon to, 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 to come along. It's, it's, um, it's nice to be able to do a, a whiskey festival again, even if, it's, even if it's a virtual one. It doesn't mean they don't have to pour Shelton any free drams, but uh, all good. Four drams today, um, all from the Speyside Distillery, the most vaguely named distillery in the country. Uh, a couple of them, and I think, yeah, I think I might be right. A couple of these, will be. this will be the first time we've ever tasted them in public. Um, two of them were, were due for release in March this year, and then, then a, a small matter of a global pandemic kind of stopped the launch, and they've only just started going out to different markets now. So it seemed as good an excuse as any to, to get them on the tastings here so that we could, we could try them out. One for an event, one of them is a, a single cask for an event that never happened. Um, and one of them is, a, is an age statement, which we never, we, we haven't done a lot of that because as you'll hear from the, the patter, the distillery is not that old and we didn't inherit a lot of old stock when we took the distillery on. So uh, Nigel's got a few pictures, just to show you where the whiskey's coming from. Nigel's got a couple of pictures um, of our distillery and the landscape around the distillery. So I don't know if you want to, this is our distillery here. As you can see, it looks quite old. It's a converted 17th century mill. Uh, the still house is that bit on the right hand side. Um, built by hand, owned originally by uh, the guy that owned the Scotch selection um, indie bottles, George Christie. Um, this was his weekend hideaway. It was never part of his business empire. And it actually took him 30 years to build it. So he started building the distillery in about 1965. He finished it in 1987. And it didn't start producing until 1990, which is exactly when the whiskey industry was crashing the last time. So Brickladdy was mothballed. Lockside was, had been bulldozed. Not a good time to open a whiskey business. Um, and almost from the start, they struggled. They, they were selling single casks to bottlers left, right, and center. But it is a small very beautiful distillery, um, open to visitors by appointment now. So if you are in the area, let us know and we'll try and get you in to, to see it. Um, if it looks familiar to anybody who's never been there before, it's because it was the location, if anybody remembers the TV show Monarch of the Glen from the early noughties, a BBC Highland drama thing. This was the distillery that was used in the TV show. Um, and the BBC left the old distillery sign and the TV show was called Lag and More. And we still have that sign uh, inside the still house hanging on the wall. It's great for confusing German whiskey crowds because you know I'll, I'll, I'll post it on whiskey forums every now and again. And then you suddenly think, you know, there's people think they've, they've not actually visited every distillery in Scotland after all. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a beautiful little distillery. It's the first distillery that the River Spey passes. So we are right down south in the region next to Aviemore. So anybody that drives up the A9, uh, you pass Dalwini, and then if you drew a line at two o'clock, about 10 miles northeast, you would hit us. Well hidden, properly secret, um, and an absolutely fantastic place to visit if you get the chance. So I don't know if there's, there's a picture of the still house, Nigel. The inside where you can see the stills. There we go. That's the inside of that, that building you saw. Unusual because everything's in one room. Um, stills not that big, an 11,000 and 8,000 litre stainless steel. Looks like the distillery is 30 years old. However, nothing in there is, is automated. So the distillery manager still decides on everything. Uh, chooses the barley, chooses the cut times, all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's still very kind of rudimentary. Um, as a result, we, we've got a, our basic spirit is very, very floral, very sweet. Our new make spirit, if you get a chance to taste it. Um, we have a, a pretty long um, fermentation time. And uh, as you can see, the stills are quite tall and slim. So we get a very sweet, floral, grassy, uh, unpeated whiskey. We do do peated, but that's for later. Um, and that 
leads us nicely into the first dram because we wanted to do a whiskey that, that kind of leads people into, um, I'm just going to bring up the view. You can take that one down again, thanks. Um, yeah, this brings to the first whiskey, which, which we call Trutina, Latin name for, uh, Latin word for balance and purity. Um, chap that owns our distillery loves his Latin books. And because we were later to the, the game than every other distillery, you know, all the other guys had used the Gallic words first. So uh, we decided not to do that. Um, but this is the closest we have in the range to, to our new make. Uh, it's very simple. You can see from the color, it's very pale. It's refill bourbon. Um, this is multi-vintage age-wise, but, but nothing here in the bottle is, is too old. We didn't feel it needed to be uh, very old. But it's a great, Shelton stole my joke about it being breakfast whiskey and his, his tasting earlier on. Um, but it is... Eggs Benedict. Have this, with, have this with Eggs Benedict. Yeah. That's what you want with this. This one's like, this one reminds me of cream soda actually. And I've got my own bottle here for drinking, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, when we tasted this, we. We were a Jim Swan project. If anybody knows who Jim Swan is, he was a, a whiskey consultant who sadly passed away a few years ago. But he helped an awful lot of the new distilleries out that, that um, appeared. So people like Penderin, Kilhoman, Lindors were all Jim Swan project. Cavalan was a Jim Swan project. And although we we're an older distillery than those guys, we changed owners in 2012. And Jim Swan was a consultant that we used. And one of the first whiskies we put out was similar to this, but, but had then been finished in port casks. So this, we decided we wanted to do, uh, you know, we wanted to put into the bottle where our whiskies would start. So pretty much everything we've done since we got hold of the distillery starts like this one. But it is, it's, we bottle it at 46%. Most people don't realize it's 46%. It's really, really light. Um, there's no alcohol burn at all. I say American cream soda. This is the one that always, always catches me. And it is, it's just a great one to start tasting. If you ever get people that say they don't like whiskey, this is a great one to try them on. Um, you very rarely ever see people trying to go away and dilute this because they can't take the alcohol. Which, uh, and it, it just goes to show that you don't need to have something that's crazy old for somebody to, to like it. It's a great little starting point. We batch produce it, so each bottle is, is numbered. It's 18,000 bottles per batch, so we'll put 50 or 60 casks together every time we need to do a batch. And it's become one of our most popular lines as a result. It's a, it's it's a great, great one. You, it's a you, great you, one to sort of tickle the palate into what's coming next. So We have, we have three of your whiskies on all the time in Remedy. And, and this is the one that sells sells best. Uh, we've got the, the Tenny and the Fumari. Fumari's pretty good. And Tenny, you know, is easy to drink as well, but yeah. this is the one that sells. And th this is this is a proper summer whiskey. I mean, if you, you get a good day. I don't know if anybody's ever seen, I've never, I've never been lucky enough to get to Japan, but they do a lot of highball stuff there. You know, the, you get the glass with the, the ice. This is a great whiskey, you know, don't, don't shoot me for saying mix it, but this is a great whiskey for doing kind of summer spritzer style almost, uh, you know, whiskey drinking. It's a proper kind of all day coffer and it catches a lot of people out. It does, it, it, you know, it surprises everybody because it's, it's the cheapest one in our range um, and it doesn't have, you know, it's, it's not dark brown in colour, so it doesn't, catch people's eyes immediately. But when they taste it, in blind tastings, it always scores well. Sorry, Paul, what age did you say this was, uh, approximately? It's it's batched, so there's casts of different ages, but probably between five and seven, maybe eight years old. Yeah, good. I'm just checking our website, what we've got it, we've got it on here. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's bur would you say bourbon casks? Most of these would be refill. If you see the, the color there, the color, I, I love the arguments that colors of whiskey can inspire because there's certain parts of the world where every whiskey's got to look like, you know, I, I love it if you go to, you know, I was in China last year and, and they've got such a, a hunger, a thirst for whiskey out there, but, but 
perception that everything's got to look like a 50-year-old Macallan, you know, so three-year-old bourbon casks are, are, are darkened up. And can compare that when you go to Germany and if you put, if you put caramel colouring in any whiskey, you have to put a label on the bottle in Germany um, because they consider that an additive. So the natural, you know, more of the European and now, you know, Canada as well, you're seeing more and more people that are looking for natural whiskey that's not been filtered and all that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, I used to work with Berclady uh, as their distributor for a few years before they sold to the, before they sold to Remy Quantrill. And I always liked what Berclady and what people like Aaron were doing. And just, so when, when we started doing bottlings for Europe and North America, we wanted to get as many of them at 46% at least and also natural colors. So, and you'll see a bit of the color variation as the tasting packs go on today. So, what does everybody think so far? Is this worth leaving work early for? It's a great start to the weekend. Not too bad. I, I say I can sit and drink this. This is not, it's not heavy whiskey. You don't need a cigar. You don't need a big red leather armchair and a coal fire for this one. This is, you know, but there are big heavy whiskies out there that aren't actually as strong as this. It's proof that, you, you know, high alcohol doesn't need to necessarily come with, you know, crazy kick you in the head flavors. So, yeah. good. I've been looking. I've been looking forward to this tasting all week. Because oh. um, I've been. I've, I was at the uh, Speed Distillery in the um, last year for the festival. It was nice. the first one, first ever time, and it was fantastic. In fact, if I stop my video, you can actually see my. Uh, I'll stop it there. There's a picture of me outside the distillery on a good day. <laughs> you found the one. You, that must have been our one day of summer. Well, interesting. When I arrived, it was snowing. Then it started raining. Then it was sleet. Um, but it was oh, what a day! It was fa absolutely fantastic. I stayed overnight in um, was it King Yeah, yeah, yeah. King is um, the nearest town. So. Yeah, so I stayed there. That was a very good night as well. So oh. highly recommend if you haven't get a chance. But yeah, I mean King is hardly a metropolis, but it's a great, it's a great, um, yeah, great wee term to visit. But um, yeah, I, I don't I don't go up to the distillery anywhere near as much as I, I would like to. Um, but uh, I do love visiting there, and it's a shame because normally I'm up there for the Spirit of Speyside Festival, which didn't happen this year. Um, we, you know, you saw from the pictures, and you've been there. It's it's a beautiful little distillery, but the the, the original owner kept it very very quiet, kept it very private. Um, he'd started building that distillery back in the days when nobody was when whiskey tourism wasn't a thing. Um, you know, you would never build a distillery nowadays and not put a visitor centre there. Um, but when we took over, we were, we needed to do something to let people see it. So it has to be by appointment. We're not allowed to change the access roads and we can't put car parks and stuff in there. Um, but we opened a wee shop in Aviemore just up the road from it. So you can do a tasting in there or you can get, you can check the diary for the folk that are at the distillery and get a tour there. And it's amazing how many people actually have visited now. Um, the visitors book is chock full of names. We've usually got a, a, a fairly busy day and hopefully that will start to come back now that people can travel again. So, It is a fab wee shop. I, I was in there last year. Um, actually that's what I got. I got this uh, cast stave with the space site distillery on it. Probably can't see it from there but it kind of just sits on the, it kind of sits three bottles just really nicely. <laughs> that, that, that'd be why my, one of my barrels is leaking. <laughs> I also got the last bottle of uh, Tenny Cast Strength while I was there. They almost they almost didn't sell it to me. They were like, "Oh, I don't know, I don't know if we can let you have this." Yes, you know, this is. I mean, one of the things I like. I mean, I've worked with. I've been in this industry for far too long. Usually working for working as a distributor, so it's me that takes a distillery's product and puts it on the market. This is the first distillery I've worked for. You know, as a as part of the as part of the actual ownership team. So you know, you know, we get to see the products before. When I was working as Bricladi's distributor, you would see the products when they were ready to be sold. So you would, you know, the distillery would show you what was ready. You'd decide on a price, and then I would go around all the shops and try and get customers for it. When you work for a distillery, you start to see you start at the idea stage, and some of the ones that we've got today were, were literally conversations. 
and within six months there were bottles on a shelf but we bottle in such small quantities especially you know a lot of these things are ones we've done for the first time so we don't want to make a, a, an expensive mistake by bottling 50,000 bottles of something that nobody wants so you will see as we go through the tasting pack uh, and if you take a look at what's on Victor's website some of these bottlings are in very small quantities um, the cast strength range you know we do a cast strength of this one Victor mentioned the cast strength Tenny, um, those were ideas. We decided to do some cast strength versions because we wanted to see what this tasted like when you did it at barrel strength. And it, it blew us away, but we only did 1,500 bottles in each batch. And then the cast strength Tenny won the World Whiskey Award. And then the following year, the cast strength version of this did the same. And all of a sudden, we're sitting in the office going, you know, we really should have bottled 10,000 bottles or 12,000 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and now we have a, it's a great problem to have, um, and it's a, certainly a, a much better problem than, than, than having a warehouse full of stock that nobody wants. But people are still stopping me in shows in Germany and asking if we're going to do this cast strength tenny again. Um, there was plans to do another one this year, but it might be next year now because of the, the last three months of closed down. What did everybody think of the first one though? Good with this? Yeah, it's like an old friend. Right, we should, we should move on to number two. And as I said, these whiskies, we, we were surprised when we decided to do some experiments with cast strength. Um, there was a, a lot of things that happened in small distilleries. It's probably the same in other small distilleries, but ours is certainly this way. A lot of these things are happy accidents. So a couple of years, you know, 2015, we got asked to do a festival bottle for a festival in Holland. Um, we did. It was a huge success. Our Swiss distributor asked us to do one for his festival, and he thought he was getting a barrel, and, and we'd actually bottled a butt, so we bottled twice as many bottles as normal. So we had 550 instead of 300 or, instead of 300 or something. So we took half of the cask back and we bottled it for the Spirit of Speyside Festival in 2016. And ever since then, we've done a, a bottling every year for the Spirit of Speyside Festival. Victor's got the first one. 16, Spirit of Speyside 16. This is, uh, now Paul, this is a... Uh, it was a sherry bot. Single sherry bot, cask 899. Well, this was cask 898. This was, the, this was the cask that sat next door to it. This was the one we did for the, the Hague. Um, they took all the bottles. So if our Swiss guy had bought all the bottles, we would never have had a festival bottle. But um, the only downside is, you know, sherry butts were something the original owner was buying. They were probably quite easy to buy in the 1990s. A lot more difficult to buy now. We've never found any other casks that go that colour. We've been dipping casks for ages to find more like that. So my, my, my bottle here was, um, was bottled in... March 2016. When was yours bottled? This one would have been October 2015. Right, okay. So it was a few months before. The Hague Festival in Holland is usually in November. Okay. And this one's at 48.7. Yeah, we're 56 on this one. So so you, you've, you've kind of trumped me, right? <laughs> the thing is, I had two bottles of this one from The Hague and I donated one at a charity auction. It went for a load of money, so I haven't opened that one yet. No, put that back in the shelf on my on my. We, we donated it. I donated it as a sort of thing for the Ben and, you know, it was one of those when you, everybody donates bottles, you all try and trump each other and Ken Lindsay had thrown in like a 50 million year old Chivas thing and you're like, oh God, I've got to do something good. So I put one of my own collection in and it, it went, it only got beaten in the auction by the the Shivers and I think a, a Springbank one of one that was in the auction. But I, I actually bid on I bid on your your bottle, but I, I'm just not that rich. I'm scared to open that one now because nobody in Holland's got them either. So. But it, it showed us what we can do with high strength. It showed us what we can do with with um, festival bottles and stuff. So this is a what you've got now is this year. So this is the festival that never happened. This year we did. Every year since then, we've done a bottling for the Spirit of Speyside Festival. This was going to be this year's release, which you would have bought, you would have been able to buy in the distillery and at our shop in Aviemore. And then 
any that were left after the festival would be sold to some of our, our, our favourite stores in the UK. There's only 300 bottles every year. It's one barrel. And uh, this one effectively is uh, just, it's just bourbon cask. This one is the same. This is the cask strength version of your first dram. So this is what happens when you bottle. This is, this is I think it's 59.5%. Uh, this one was bottled as a five-year-old. But in our normal range, you will see a cast strength version of the Trutina, which was the one that won this year's World, World Whiskey Award for best no age statement, Speyside. And this is a single cask of that. So this is, you know, cranked up to the next level again. Um, I really like this whiskey and um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not delighted there was a pandemic, but if the fact is I probably would have struggled to get this. I would have been begging you to send me a couple of bottles down as a favour, um, but, but we managed to get a couple of cases of it. Um, and I think the other thing you did about the, with this whiskey is normally, normally you, you knock these festival single casts out about 90, 100 pounds. Um, I think this one came out about 75, 80. Yeah. Yeah, well, we were we were aware. I mean, and um, you know, a lot of the distilleries up in Speyside, the Spirit of Speyside Festival is an amazing thing to get to. It's like an entire week of, you know, shenanigans basically. Some of the most incredible tastings go on. You know, you get guys like, and you've got George Grant coming on here tomorrow. But you get guys like George Grant will be taking his own distillery tours around the distillery and all that. Things that you just money can't buy that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, 40 odd distilleries are involved and we were all sitting there and every one of them, there was lots of messenger app, WhatsApps and everything going back and forth. Some of them that have got visitor centres, I mean, Glen Farkas are still not, they're not going to open their visitor centre this year now. No, oh, they're keeping it closed for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, so this is, I hope this, this pandemic never comes back because this is the festival that never happened. This is, you know, and I think Glen Farkless have done something similar. Their festival bottles are available through very specific places. Yeah. I'm sure Glen Allocky did a festival bottle and a few of the other guys up there. Um, because these were all, you know, if you imagine, these would all have been in, in the bottling plans in March. Festival was at the end of April. So, you know, the wheels are in motion for this. And then, of course, middle of March, everything closed. Um, so I hope we never get a repeat of of this but the benefit is we, we, we then get to use the, the, the festival bottle for something else and this is a cast strength version of or a single cask version of the, the Trotina cast strength. In, in this is super duper. I, um, 59.5 you probably don't have to use water everybody's palate is going to be a bit different but you know I've tasted whiskies at 40% before that you know you, you see people gasping after they're drunk it because it's there's stuff so fiery but our whiskey and this is all of our cast strength stuff seems to be the same our whiskey at high strength still holds a softness and a flavor that we didn't expect you know there's a lot of whiskies out there that bottle a bottle that cast strength maybe shouldn't be um, and it becomes a kind of macho thing where people trying to outdo each other on the, the ABV stuff um, but yeah, it's, it's 300 bottles. It's an event that didn't happen. And it's great that we're still able to sit and taste it. So, Guys, cheers. Thank you. But it's like the bigger brother of the first one. So it's, it's breakfast plus. This is a Livensy's whiskey. Uh, I, sh I really should read the comments. What's Shelton saying? Do they do whiskey top trumps? We should do whiskey top trumps. Well, you're beating me at the moment. I'm going to have to find some something else in my spay armory. Oh, we should. We should. I mean, I think. I think. What's his name? Trump even has a whiskey because he's got that. He's got that hotel up Aberdeen way, and somebody. I think it was Glenn Glass or somebody did a did a whiskey for him that you can buy in the shop up there or something. But full um, of sulphur, I hope. What's that? Full of sulphur, I hope. Actually, I think um, I think the first time you came to Southport, I did trump you because um, I remember I took you into the guest house uh, and they had a bottle of Spay, thirty year old. Yeah, which um, I'm not quite sure where they got it from, but it did have a lot of kind of Chinese or Japanese uh, writing on the back. 
Well, this is. I'm this not is, sure if you'd ever seen that before. I've seen pictures of those. I've never actually seen a bottle in the flesh. Well, they had one in the guest house on Union Street, Southport. But this is this is where the history of our distillery goes funny because the, the chap that owns the distillery now is called John Harvey McDonough. He's from Durham. He was formerly a marketing guy for Diageo, but by, by the late 90s, he was living in Taiwan, working on, you know, Singleton and all this kind of stuff. And he set himself up as an indie bottler, buying casks in Scotland. Bearing in mind, the 90s, there was a, a you know, a recession on. There was, we were one of, I think, two distilleries to open in the 1990s in Scotland. Aaron being the other big single malt distillery a couple of years after us. Um, but most distilleries were, there was a whiskey lake. They were selling casks everywhere. You know, you could get, we were joking about this earlier, <laughs> earlier on. You were, you were getting like 30, 30 year old whiskeys in the supermarket for 30 quid a bottle and all kinds of stuff. Um, and John was living in Taiwan. And he started, he, he had the Spey brand name. His middle name is Harvey. He's a descendant of the Harvey distilling clan who sort of nine generations prior to that were the builders of Bricladi. So he'd started buying casks from everywhere. Um, so effectively he owned the Spey brand name. Um, and if you wander around Taipei, you will find bottles of Spey that are dated as 1975, 80, 85. Um, and of course our distillery didn't start producing until 1990, so they just, they can't be from our distillery. Um, if you look at the nor the current bottles now, if I get that to the camera, right underneath it will say Spey from Speyside Distillery. Yeah. yeah. The Asian bottles he was doing before he owned this distillery uh, don't have that. I think the other thing, the other thing about that bottle was um, the, the, the little bit of English writing on the back said it was, I'm pretty sure it said it was bottled in, in Durham. Yeah, well, he, John lived, John's from Durham. It was probably a bottling contract done by Lanchester Wines or somebody. Right, so, and, and I, and I kind of, it was Scotch whiskey, and I'm kind of thinking he was probably bending the rules a wee bit by... Uh... I don't know the full thing. I mean, we've been, we've been, uh, you know, well, Speyside as a region, the fact, the fact it was only really recognised by the Scotch Whiskey Association, I think officially about 2008, 2009. Right. I don't know when that one would have been bottled. It's probably a, a mid nineties bottling, maybe because it was only ever going to be sold on the other side of the world, you know? Yeah, but well, we, we finished it off. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we, we do all our bottling in Glasgow now, just we, we always have done since, since John took over, but we were, ours was one of the distilleries that was, he was buying casks from in the nineties. The distillery went up for sale in 2012 and John put some of his friends in Taiwan together and they bought the distillery. So um, at that point, Spey joined the Speyside Distillery and became Spey from the Speyside Distillery. So well, post-2013. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the range that we have, if you ever go to Taiwan, we've got different whiskies on sale over there. It's a bit like what Shelton was saying earlier on about, you know, the Paul John stuff in India. Because the, the palate over there is different, you know. So, you know, we have got a lot more whiskies that, have a, a sherry influence, whereas over here we're playing with wine casks and things like that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and these ones that you've tasted were ones that we did specifically to, to launch here in Europe first. They've now gone into various different parts of the world. But um, yeah, I, I, we're definitely going to be doing more of the single cask thing. I love doing that. It's um, when you're a small distillery, you get to experiment quite a lot. We, we're not under any pressure. To, to bottle a million bottles a year. And would you, do a, would you do a single cask, especially for a whiskey club in the northwest of England? Um, there's, never, there's never a way to say, well, never say never to anything like that. Okay. We've, we've never done a single cask for a whiskey club. But five years ago, we'd never done a single cask for a whiskey festival. And we'd never done a single cask for a, a distributor. We've now done festival bottles, we've now done distributors. So we've got, again, I know Paul John have done the same. You know, our German distributor has his own, they've chosen their own casks. Our um, Belgian distributor's got their own casks. Uh, certainly something we could look at. Okay, let's talk about that later, because this, uh, 
that this is this is great. I really, really, really like this one. Um, but yeah, that's so that's two bourbon casks at two totally different strengths, but two two brothers from the same brood. And uh, hopefully, it gives you an idea of you know some of the things we get to play with. Uh, when we took over the distillery, it wasn't like the Glenallachy purchase where, you know, there's a, a warehouse full of brilliant old stock. You know, our distillery had sold pretty much all their old casks just to stay alive in the 90s. So anybody that's wandering around whiskey shops, some of the best bargains you can find, check out what some of the indie bottlers have got because I have got, maybe in, in my little stash, I've got about half a dozen bottles from the early 90s from our distillery. Yeah. Bottled by Caddenheads, uh, Morris and Mackay have done them. I think Single Cask have done them. David Sturk has done some. So these must have been floating around brokers for, for a while. Um, but this is whiskey. I mean, it's, it would have been sold as a cask, a cask of two or three year old spirit. And they've been sitting in warehouses since then. And some of the ones that I've tasted getting bottled are, I've not had a bad one yet, but it all tends to be single casks. And they're all over the place. There's loads of them in Germany. Yeah. So there must have been a broker that go hold their casks and then ship them out to a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of indie bottlers in Germany. And I've never done a festival over there yet where somebody hasn't appeared with, with a 1994 bottle from our distillery, which is absolutely astounding. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the owners of the distillery at the time didn't, the market wasn't there for single casks in the 90s. And they were just probably just clawing on to stay alive. So, you know. Think about how it's changed. There's been more distilleries that have opened in Glasgow in the last three years than opened in Scotland in the whole of the 1990s. You know, it might be difficult when they all, all these new distilleries all suddenly turn up with five-year-old whiskey in a couple of years' time. But um, it's, it's a lot of fun now. So It's going to be interesting, I think, because I, I think, uh, you know, all, all these new distilleries are, are certainly looking for their own USB, their own, their own style, their own thing that they're going to do that's... that's you know, that's maybe not as traditional as some of the older guys. Oh, um, yeah. And not just not just Scotch. I mean, you've got, there, there, there's, you know, dozens of distilleries in Germany now. Um, whole pile of them. There's a couple in Italy. There's several in Switzerland. Yeah. And they're all experimenting and doing different stuff. You know? Yeah. Well, if you come on my uh, my tasting tomorrow afternoon with uh, George, Ebon, and Jill, I'm not telling you what they are. But my, well, some interesting my, stuff floating around. I mean, my Swiss distributor owns a distillery, and some of the stuff they've got over there. I, I was wandering around their warehouse last October. I'm like, you got to get this in a bottle. It's like we're not even sure it would be allowed as whiskey. You know, it's just obscure wine casks and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we didn't have a lot of old stock, so we, following Jim Swan's advice, we we looked to do cask finishing. We needed to make our whiskey. You know, the the last thing you want is fifty different bourbon cask all arriving on the shelf at the same time. So we went to cask finishing and we, our first release of cask finish was a Tony Port cask. Uh, normal one in the range is called Spade Tenny, which is a beautiful red color. It was really, the first batch we ever did that was seriously dark, dark red. Um, and it got us noticed because it was, you know, there's not many, at that point, there wasn't many port cask whiskies on the market at under 40 pounds a bottle. Um, that was a couple of years ago now. Uh, but what we've got is on, on tasting note or, or dram number three from the tasting pack is our brand new Spay 12 year old. And it's a Tony port finish. So the, the no age statement, Tony, different 12 year old. Is that the port one? Oh, it is. That's it there, isn't it? Right, okay. See, this is this one is so new. I still don't, because we locked the bond down and locked the office in March, I don't even have a bottle of this to hand. <laughs> it's um, got a couple. But, uh, it can sort you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, normally I would have walked into the office and just taken one out of the sample cupboard, but I can't get into the office at the moment. Um, when we did the, the Tony Port, no age statement one. It was really, really dark red. Um, and it was like, a, it was about an eight year old single malt with a six month cask finish. Um, but when we got those Tony Port casks back in 2012, 13 or whatever, 
we did lay some down as well. So what you've got here is it's still a cask finish, but it's a much longer cask finish and it's a much older liquid. So this is a 12 year old, um, but it's 20 port. Uh, what a lot of the comments on the port, the, the, the no age limit one were very sweet, but not like a, not a typical whisk, not like the, 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 the first one, not, not vanilla, not cream soda, not, you know, fudge, but the port cast gave it a fruit, a sort of summer fruit. So strawberries, grapes, berries. That's like Ibina. Come on, you can yeah, drink yeah, it yeah, Ibina. It was just, it was um, just deliciously easy to drink. And it made me think, well, these, these were poor. It made me think that maybe fortified, you know, we all know about sherry casks, but maybe, maybe it's fortified wine that, that really works well with spirit because I've tasted a few, we've not got one, but I've tasted a few Madeira cask finishes out there. And I think they're spectacular as well. Aaron do one and Penderin do one as well. And I, I think they're spectacular. And I think maybe fortifying a wine and using that, then, then using that wine cask, maybe it's something, uh, maybe it's something we need to do more of. Um, but I'm really chuffed with this. We, you know, when I, when I, when Bricladi got sold to Remy in 2012, 2011, I kind of knew that I was going to have to go and hit the job market fairly shortly afterwards. Um, and, you know, I'd never even heard, I'd never even heard of Space Age at that point. And you go in there and it's, it's no age statement and all that stuff. I'd previously worked with Aaron Distillers as a distributor. So no age statement whiskies, I was totally fine with. I actually like the fact that you can experiment and muck around a lot more. Um, but I never thought we would get to the stage where we would have age statements back in the range. And we've got a couple of them now. If you imagine how the whiskey, you know, without being a history teacher, imagine, you know, by the late nineties, the whiskey industry was on its knees. So most distilleries and ourselves, we were definitely one of them. They weren't producing spirit all year round. They were, they were, you know, cutting capacity back, which you've probably seen with a lot of the other distilleries is, is things like the 15 and 18 year olds from the whiskey ranges all sort of dropped off the market a few years ago. But they're starting to come back now because in 2003, 2004, a lot of the production started climbing again. So I know you now get, I think Glenn Livett went no age statement. They're coming back. McAllen have now announced new age statements. Um, so it's an exciting time to be to be around, but this is our first. We did a twelve-year-old peated whiskey last year, which is the next dram in the tasting pack. But this is our first unpeated twelve-year-old. So, and it's an interesting label you've got on here, actually. I mean, this is this is that bottle. You can mm -hmm. see you can see the color of it. Um, uh, uh, you can you know you can you can tell it's got that kind of ready pink tinge uh, that it's been in uh, port, but. It doesn't say that in the label. It just says in big writing, 12 years old. And then in very small writing, you've really got to look for it. It says it's uh, from Tony Portcasks, mm -hmm. finished in Tony Portcasks. So it's, I mean, normally what, what you would see in it on, is it would be well marked that it would be from, from Tony Port. You guys, you haven't done that. It's, it's like way down here. Yeah, there's, well, there's probably, that, that's us probably being cautious, to be honest. Um, and the reason, the the no age statement version is called Tenny, which is T E N N E. Now, my gaffer claims that that's the Latin word for Tony. I think it's not. I don't speak Latin too much, but it's got an acute on it, like the French. Yeah. Uh, and they don't use that in Latin. Um, but when I joined the company, the original boxes for the no age statement one had Tony in big letters, T A W N Y. And I think we were kind of, we didn't get a, a wrist slap, but we were advised that by the SWA that that might, having that, the word, you know, a descriptor for another product, that big on a label, would might confuse the consumer. So they might think they were buying port and not buying whiskey if we put Tony. So right. we needed to find another word that, that meant Tony port that didn't say Tony port, which is why yeah. the, the new agent one is Tenny. Um, we probably had the label printer booked, so we needed another five letter word in all reality. There's probably a story about how we checked old textbooks, but yeah, we were probably, you know, the boxes were actually printed with the other word. Yeah. Um, if the boss is listening, I'll get my ass kicked for that. Um, right, we're only recording it and putting it on YouTube forever. Yeah, no, oh, it's, it won't be the most embarrassing thing I've said in a tasting, Victor. So, um, but yeah, so now 
it is Scotch whiskey is the prominent word on the label. Uh, the age is the prominent one. Again, we've been waiting for years to get an age on the range. So when we were when we were sitting in the office again, these ideas that come become reality. We were sitting there, and it's it's like, what do we call it? Do we need to have another name? Do we need a Trutina type name? Like, no, just get the number on it. We're twelve years old. There will be people that have been waiting for a whiskey that's got an age, um, and that's that's where that is. It should have been out three months ago. But it's great to be able to see what I want to see what response you guys have got to it because you guys are the first people outside of the the company that are that are tasting it in public. So, well, I can tell you there's some, a few orders going through for it. I'm just my my little email tickers. There's, there's question from question from um, How long is the Tony Port ca the, our cask finishing starts at six months, um, but for this one it's longer. I think we're over a year on this. But there might well be a, this is a bigger brother of a 10 year old that we did a few years ago. I remember that. And the 10 year old is an absolute gunship. It was the first, um, it, it was part matured in port and part matured in bourbon. And that 10 year old took the biggest award we've ever got for our whiskey, sold out pretty much everywhere. I think there's still the last bottle was on Victor's website. Um, but I don't have any in the office. Um, and it's good because that coupled with the Tony cast strength sort of meant that whenever we announce a new limited edition, we've already got, you know, folk in different countries waiting for it. But um, yeah, we're very proud of this one. I haven't tasted it from a bottle. I've only tasted the samples that we had before we, we sent them off to the bottler. Is that that one? That the one. Ten year old. Concours Mondial last year, and I know I'm a judge on it, so I'm going to be biased, but I wasn't a judge on the Scotch whiskies. This was the only distillery bottling in, from Scotland that got the Grand Gold Medal. Um, Nigel, can you sell this out on the website, take all the stock off? Yeah, well, I've, I've got one already, so there's <laughs> not very many left. Um, well, Shilton, Shilton will be chuffed because the other, there were seven whiskies, out of 1,800 spirits entered. It's an all spirits competition. Seven whiskeys got grand gold. That was one. Paul John Nirvana, I think, got one. Boutique whiskey got one for a single cask. Finlagen, which is the an indie bottler from Isla, got one. But um, and the others were like Cavalan, um, you know, Roselures and French. So a lot of world whiskey. But um, show the colour on that one, Victor, as well. That there were. There are four of those left on the site um, right now. And, and I had that one because I knew they would just go. Um, that's that's why I like. And found oh, they were still there. The 12 year old is the, you know, we bottled 3000 bottles of that because we knew we wanted to do a 12 year old in a couple of years time. We've not got much of the 12 year old left now as well, won't you? But, <laughs> but that is, I mean. The 10, the, the 10 is good. It's, I was trying to decide whether to do the 10 or the 12 Tony Port, and I thought I'll the probably have to pick up the 12 Tony Port. The warehouse, though, yeah. It's only just, just hit the market. Aye. It's, a, it's a great dram to have as a... But hopefully you can see the difference between this one and the first one. Because these are both... The first one is 46% as well. And you can see the difference that a cask finish will have to, to, to our whiskey. Because essentially they both started off the same way. And again, one of the things we noticed with our distillery, when you do a cask finish, like the port cask, the change between that and the standard whiskey is very dramatic in terms of flavors. Whole tidal waves of new flavor and new tasting notes appear. Um, you know, if this was a, you know, I know some of the, the more established distilleries, they're more conscious if they do a cask finish, you've still got to have some of the character of their original ones. but. With us, you know, it's two whiskies from the same distillery that are very, very similar in their concept, but massively different in flavour. So, and I hope I hope it likes it. Some nice comments coming down the side of the screen. So, thank you, pear drops and rhubarb and custard. I shouldn't read tasting. Thanks for you. I shouldn't read tasting notes like that before dinner. Now I'm bloody hungry. <laughs> He's been raiding the Douglas Lang sweets again. <laughs> <laughs> That might, I think there might be another one that I've got single casks of ours in their warehouse. Douglas Lang and Hunter Lang and all those guys, because they were all 
it was guys like that that kept our distillery alive, I think, in the 90s. Yeah, I've had, a, I've had a few out of uh, Douglas Lang and Hunter Lang space sites. Um, yeah. um, this one's on the website as well. It's the 2019. Do you remember this one? Yep, that was last year's Spirit of Space Ride Festival, which is port cask again. Is that a port cask? Is it? I think is that the red one? Is it? That sort of dark colour, be port cask. No, once you take the, the the hanky off the bottle, the hanky's not going back on the bottle. Once it's off, it's off. No, oh, that's, that's those are those are a one shot deal. Those tissue paper things. This is drawn from a single bottle wine cask. Ah. Right, different animal. So that's that's one of those experiments in our distillery because we do, you know, whenever you travel and you meet people, we try and find casks. Now we, we, we've got friendships with a few different wine producers and sherry houses um, and we'll get single barrels or maybe two or three barrels off them to do experiments with and that's where that would have come from. We, we bought that I think we bought the barrels for that from a, a cooper. So we weren't allowed to name the chateau that did the wine. Um, but we'd never done a Bordeaux wine cast before. So that was a, the Spirit of Speyside Festival bottle last year. Yeah. Um, currently in the warehouse, we've got, I say our Swiss distributor owns, owns a distillery. He sent over two of his wine casks that came from Northern Italy. And we've got those sitting in Inverhouse at the moment. We, we warehouse in Inverhouse. And um, they're sitting in our warehouse at the moment, and we'll check them occasionally and taste them because that, that might be the next next year's limited editions. But we literally got two barrels from different wineries. But the good thing is that like his relationship with the winery means we can name the cask. Yeah. And this is our thirtieth year, so we also bought some Solera barrels, proper old, not not sherry seasoned, nothing like that. These were proper old Solera casks from two of the what I think of the best bodega in Jerez or Jerez. And um, we've got those sitting in the, the warehouse as well. Just but the finish on those is going to need to, it'll, it'll take a bit longer. So that'll be something you'll see next year. Um, and we will be able to name the winery as well. But yeah, that's, I can't wait to try those ones. I've tasted some of the early samples and they will, they will blow your mind, Victor. Some of these, I can't barrels, wait. Some of these <laughs> barrels were decades old, you know, so. Uh, but, um, so that was a 12 year old. We've got another 12 year old to follow. And I, this is where. I feel like I'm, 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 I'm waiting for Shilton to start smiling. So <laughs> there we go. There we go. We know what Shilton likes. Um, for those of you who don't know, Shilton is completely daft for peated whiskey. Loves it. Paul John Nirvana is probably purely because of Shilton, <laughs> you know, smuggling Pete back. Uh, but he was, he was telling me before that he, he takes it back in his suitcase. <laughs> always, always. Well, we we do. Pity one he's got. Sorry, apologies. Is that his yeah. pity? You got a pity one, have you? Yeah, number last last dram, twelve year old peated. So let me just see. I'm just seeing. I can have a look at the comments down the side here. I'm still new to Zoom, so if anybody's got any questions, fire away. Let's see what we can do. So I see Gordon and Das there as well. Oh my God, wow! I've been trying to phone you, Gordon. You, can you give me a call, please? <laughs> yeah. The, the twelve-year-old's great. I, I've already had one bottle of it this year. Um, I, I got that in the the 2020 Spirit of Space. I more or less as soon as they were out. Um, and it's just like, Victor, just get what you can with this stuff. It's absolutely fabulous. And, and the 2020 is even better. That, that is just one awesome bottle. I, I'm so sad that there's only 300 of that because I'll probably go through about half of them, give, well, given, given the chance. Well, that's it. And it's weird because it, it, it's always going to be the one that we all remember as the event that didn't happen because there's so many of us, you know, I've got little souvenirs from every Speyside festival I've ever gone to. You know, I've got Glenn Farkas' mm. festival bottle from last year. Um, so it's just a strange year for all that. But, you know, yeah. we... The other thing is, I, don't think, I don't know if there's as much whiskey being produced this year. And, you know, talking to certainly some of the smaller distilleries that closed down for the last six months. Uh, I was talking to uh, Ian, 
Ian this, at Glen Scotia this morning, and he said they're just reopening again on Monday. So, you know, 2020 is going to be a funny year. We did, we did that too. Because it's going to be like, well, that was the year that was not, what, there wasn't much happening. Well, I mean, our distillery normally shuts in July for like a month, you know, annual maintenance, strip downs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, end of March, we closed everything up. Our shop in Abbeymore was closed. The distillery was closed. You know, there was furloughs and all this kind of stuff. You know, um, on the plus side, it's that's four months I've gone without an airline losing my suitcase. Uh, <laughs> probably because I've just not left the house. Um, but our distillery is just getting ready to reopen again. So, you know, that was in July. We're normally closed in July, but Finley, our distillery manager, is getting ready to, to kick everything off again. You know, yeah, but, uh, but actually, um, you know, I, I, I had this festival back in May, um, and I, you were one of the first guys I, I got in touch with to come and come along. And, and oh, you, you know, the half your company, including you, had been followed, uh, yeah. and and we were, we were kind of touch and go whether we were going to be able to get you in. You know, you, you I think you came back on the first of, was well, the first I've done a, yeah, I've done a few of these online things in the last couple of weeks now because quite a few obviously the furloughs helped quite a few people out I think um I just hope I mean we we've had you know there's no doubt we've had changes companies changed completely in the last couple of months mm. um but one of the things one of the conditions with the, the furlough thing is I don't think you were allowed to talk I wasn't allowed to work but it's a bit crazy though isn't it I mean it's kind of like commercially like, there's, it's debatable whether anything I do is commercially beneficial to this company, but um, you know, and I'm, I've, I'm, I've I've bumped into lots of people since then because you know you send a message to folk to see if they're doing that, and I did one in Belgium, and he had a list of people he'd contacted who couldn't come on until past a certain date and stuff like that. Um, it's all stuff we've never had to deal with before. So, yeah. but but as I say, you know, we we got I, I wanted to join this, and you know, because of well, you can tell I like spay whiskey, right? Mm. Um, and and it, it was kind of it was very short notice to be able to get you in, and, and I'm glad we did. It's been well. That was that was it. I was I was watching your calendar fill up, and it was like the two days were, were full. I was like, shit, we're going to miss this. And then you know, then then we got in, and then it went from three days, and then it went to four days. It was like, oh, I, know, I know, I know, I know, and all, all the, the, the I mean, it's a team of volunteers that have put this together. It's and unbelievable. Like, Vic, can you stop? Please stop saying yes to people. Um, <laughs> it's unbelievable. That's it. It's, this, is, this is not an industry that, that I think benefits from being in ivory towers. And the fact that we can, you can actually go on social media and badger people from distilleries, I totally encourage that. I used to work in the wine trade, and I didn't even know who was, who was running the companies I worked for. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact you can get hold of people that work for distilleries, and you can have things like this, and very open, and you get, you know, like I say, tomorrow night you've got George Grant hosting a tasting, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, awesome. We, we, we had, um, we had Ardbeg uh, approached us a couple of weeks ago and I, and I stuck it out there and said to the, the team, we've got our own little chat group, uh, do you think we can squeeze Ardbeg in? And it was like, I'm, I'm not sure if we can. <laughs> um, oh, that's your, that's your, um, I hope Susanna doesn't want a Louis Vuitton handbag for Christmas then, because that's your uh, discount gone. Aye, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Uh, I'm sure they'll come back in the autumn. But um, yeah, but yeah, small distillery we are, and the experimentation thing is a lot of fun. So dram number four, uh, you'll notice it's totally different to the others, and that this is a peated one. Uh, we like a lot of distilleries up there. And I love this because when you do these festivals, you still get people that think, oh, well, smoky whiskey shouldn't come from the Highlands or from Speyside or whatever. Smoky whiskey can come from anywhere. Um, and I think an awful lot of distilleries were probably experimenting, you know, all of our, all of our distillations with peat happen at the end of each year. You saw that you showed me a single can Spirit of Speyside bottle earlier on, Victor, that I think was from two years ago, our Spirit of Speyside bottle. 
don't know which one we're on now. Let's see, that's 18. Oh, we're on the, yeah, no, there's one you showed me earlier on. It was a single cask we did for Spirit Space out a few years ago. I think it's this one. And it was, um, and I said to you, it's probably distilled in the last couple of weeks of the year. And, and you look so, at the So again, it, it, it says on it, Spirit Space Side Whiskey Festival, there's, there's 27th of April to 1st of May. It doesn't give the year. You've got to look for yeah, Small distilleries, we make mistakes like that. Yeah, 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 like, okay, what year is that festival? Um, but this was bottled in 2017, in April. So it, was, it would have been festival 2017. Um, 300 bottles, number 64, 51.8%. And it was distilled on the 20th of December, 2007. So the last couple of weeks of each year before they would shut down for Christmas, this is when... It would have been Sandy at the time was was um, was using different barley, buying in peated barley. Um, we would have brought our own peat in, but Shelton had taken it all to India. Um, <laughs> it's swiped all. We went up there with the shovels and everything. It was all gone, you know, sitting in a container with an Indian address on it, ready to go over for some Paul John. Uh, but um, so we get peated barley. It's Highland peat. Uh, and we we first put this into the whiskey that we call Fumari, which is a no-age statement, so a peated version of the brand that you had first today. Uh, that went out uh, tail end of 2016, and then we started experimenting with things like single casks. Uh, we do a cast strength version of the Fumari. We did the single cask for Spirit of Speyside, which prompted the cast strength general bottling run. Um, and this was the one we had 12 year old stocks last year. So we launched this tail end of last year. Yeah. Yeah. So it's bourbon cask, 46% non chill filtered, but it's peated barley rather than, rather than our, our, our standard. It says nothing on the front or nothing on the tube about it being peated. It's, it's in tiny little gold. Yeah. Bells on the back says matured using peated barley. And you're like, <laughs> We, we, we try and yeah, yeah, matured using peated barley. That was another one that I tried to get them to change, but it had already gone to the printer. Matured using peated barley. <laughs> oh, dear. Small, yeah, I've seen that. We haven't quite gone to the stage where we've done spelling mistakes in the labels. I've seen that with a few others as well. But uh, I'm going to keep this ball. But that's it. I mean, we're not, we're not a big, you know, I'd rather spend the money we would use on a proofreader on some new barrels. So... <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, but that is effectively a single cask version of what you have here. Um, and this is our 12 year old. Um, so it was great to get, a, this was the first age statement we'd put out for years actually, but it was great to get a, a, a 12 year old out. Even yeah. better that it was a peated one. Um, 3000 bottles, although there will be more now that we've got it in, in the range. Uh, so this is slightly older, it's probably not as punchy as the, the no age statement one. It's had a bit more time to soften down. But it's bourbon cast and what we wanted to do, and what we wanted to show is that, that, that that kind of sweetness, the kind of vanilla and the cream that you got from that first round, that cream soda kind of softness. We wanted that with the smoke. We didn't want the smoke to, to take over everything. Yeah. PPM levels, we, we think about 25 to 30. It is creamy. He said. We, didn't, we didn't set out to do an Octomore. We just, you know, um, and our stocks of peated spirit from each year vary immensely when we when we try them. That is lovely. That is lovely, Paul. Well done. But it's a great, again, I mean, anybody that, that works with whiskey knows you get great peated whiskies from distilleries that don't normally do peated whiskey. So look at what Paul John are doing. Look at what Tomatin are doing. I mean, they, they, they've, they've, given, they've given theirs a different name, but they're doing a cracker. You know, Ben Riak, Ben Romack, Aaron's Macri Moore is a stunning yeah, peated whiskey nice. from a distillery that isn't known for peated whiskey. There's lots of it about. And, you know, the fact that so many of us all started doing peated whiskey fairly recently as well shows that this is, maybe this is something we should have been doing, you know, for, for many years before. It's definitely, I think, something that will stick around now. So, some some people have been using um, X 
peated whiskey barrels to to finish off. Is that something that you guys have done, or do you? We've never done it from the start. Um, we 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 use peated barley for this. We got asked though because some of them, you know, some of the ones where you get the the exile of barrels. Yeah, they're good. But I mean, this there's no there's no salt or seaweed on that. We didn't want the isla. You know, that suits a coastal distillery, perhaps. Maybe yeah. not so much an inland one. Um, it's not something we've ever tried. It might be something we look at in the future. I know um, is there really uh, anybody that's ever, if you Google it, there's a distillery in northern Italy called Puni. The place looks like it's been designed by Ferrari. It's like a spaceship that's been stuck on the side of a mountain. Typically Italian, you know, it's a designer distillery. Um, but I used to have the same distributor as them in Germany. And they use ex Isla barrels. They're, they're shipping barrels from Isla yeah. over to the, the Dolomites. Um, and it's pretty good. It's very, very subtle. Um, you know, it's way more subtle than this. Mm. But it's an interesting, an interesting one. It's a lot better than the, the whiskey that was put in the herring cask, if anybody's ever seen that. I'm not, I'm not joking. There is. A herring? Google it. Fish. There's a whiskey out there um, oh. called Fishkey. Um, if you Google it, somebody will Google it. it. It exists, and it was done in a an X. I can't remember what distillery it was, but I hope it's not an experiment that we see a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I'll give that one a miss. I think. Never, I've never actually physically seen a bottle. I thought it was an urban legend until somebody showed me a picture. Right. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, it was great. This this kind of completed our range, and let's say next year we've got some more. We've got some more um, sherry cask stuff coming. It'll be sherry finishes, but we've, we've bought some sherry season casks. We've also bought some Excelera casks from a couple of very primo bodega. Um, so some will be very special additions, but the reason we bought uh, some Spanish or some casks in Spain as well is we wanted to get a sherried whiskey back in the range because mm. that's one thing that isn't there really at the moment. Um, and you know, with us being from the space side region, we probably should have some. It's just we just you know we used to have an eighteen year old in the range which was sherry cask. Actually, uh, that, was a, that was a delicious whiskey. I remember yeah. that was about two or three years ago. Yeah, it was a belter. They just didn't have enough of those casks, so we didn't have enough to do another batch because again, you know, an eighteen year old now would have been spirit that was distilled in nineteen ninety eight ninety nine, and by then the distillery was probably just hanging on for grim grim life you know yeah yeah so they wouldn't have been out in spain buying brand spanking new lovely soaking wet sherry casks so very good but um i think that's should we, what's, should we open, uh, what's what we got it's four should we open the if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question join in then i think we're, we're kind of at that stage eh, Paul? yeah jump in guys please Oh, this one is Thank you, actually. Um, the whiskies are amazing. So good that I've actually I've decided to buy all four of them. John, thank um, you. I love the tenny. I I'd ordered the tenny. I've got a couple of bottles in the house. I thought it's fantastic. But the, these ones are amazing. The, the first one, there was it Triana? Triana? I think it's pronounced. Tri, uh, Trutina. Tr 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 I've had too much. Trutina, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, that is a, that's for, for the obviously as a entry level space is fantastic. Oh, thank you, thank you. I can't even say it. I, I was drinking through Shelton's tasting earlier, so in about yeah. two hours I'll be sitting on an Amazon buying useless things for the house as usual when I do as it happens when I've had a drink. So, unfortunately, I missed it. I was working. I was planned to go to the uh, uh, to join it, but the only complaint I have about Paul John it should be called John Paul. Um, my friend, John, uh, Paul John was is myself and my friend Paul at the uh, Whiskey Fringe. So we both went up to the stands. So that's my only complaint. So um, you can change the name around, it'll be fantastic. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to do a distillery called George and Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's great. I'll, I'll, I'll hope to see, see you guys as, as the weekend goes on because I'm going to check in on a few of the other tastings as well. Um, I've bought my I've got my Bimber tasting pack I, and I've never had a bottle of Bimber until until I saw the festival get announced and it's great another new distillery that I need to chalk off the list so you won't be disappointed with that one 
Yeah, I mean, I'd seen the reviews they were getting, and then I realised that they were doing a bottle for the festival. It's like, right, I mean, I've got to get one. That, that's that's the treat that is. Got it lying around somewhere. Look at that. Yeah, I've got my got my little bimber box here, so it's uh, it's it's ready and waiting. I think they're on Sunday. And uh, Gordon and Dassey's on tomorrow, uh, six o'clock. Are you, are you still there, Gordon? I am, yes. I will be on tomorrow at 6 p.m. indeed. Yes, looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. We are looking forward to that as well. Bit of Glen Goyne yeah. action. Yeah, bit of Glen Goyne action. Bit of teapot action. Yeah, all good. So, yeah, no, looking forward to it. It's a great well done, Victor, putting this on. That's yeah, thanks, thanks for joining this afternoon. It's good to talk to you. I'll give you a call later. Yeah, no, absolutely. No problem. So, Paul, have you ever thought about doing New Make Spirit? I mean, it's so floral, it's so fresh. If anybody could do a good New Make, surely yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, if you go into the shop in Aviemore, we've actually got, we've actually got some, but it's not bottled at, at New Make strength. It's, they've got a few bottles at 46% in the shop. Um, obviously, we'll let folk try the New Make when they're on the, the distillery tour and stuff like that. Um, it's a tough thing to sell, actually. Yes. It doesn't fit in a category, mm. you know. And, and and if we did it, it would be a very limited thing, um, collectors only. I know a few folk of, I know like the the Clydeside Distillery are selling new make. Um, and if you remember, I think it was Glen Glass a few years ago did one that was like six months barrel aged, so it was like a sort of rosy color. Yeah. Um, and I really like that kind of stuff, but it's its market would be really, really limited. So um, we just watch, if we see more people doing it, we, we can do it. Um, we don't sell whiskey to any blenders in anymore. So we've got, you know, we're, when we run at full capacity, we probably do a bit more of that. But it's, of all the things we're getting asked about, it's one of the things that I'd love to do, but we don't get asked enough for it yet. Yeah. The more people that ask, the more people, maybe the, the closer that becomes as a, a plan, you know? Scott from Tomatin brought the new make Kubokan down, mm. um, and that's a really nice floral whiskey as well. Um, before they bugger around with that, I mean, they're and, really yeah, up the road from us, so a lot of their you know, two vastly different distillers because Tomatin's a massive distillery compared to us, but that's our nearest neighbor at the moment until the new Gordon and McPhail one opens. So, so there's a new Gordon and McPhail. Distillery, is that right? Yeah, there's a well, it's Gordon McField that own it. It's, it's, it's not, um, so it's just north of us. So we're, we're the furthest, most southerly distillery in space, I, to the extent that some people will still claim that we're Highland because we're right on the line. Um, but about five, six miles north of us now, or maybe just slightly north of Aviemore, Gordon McPhail have, have now greenlit a new distillery. Um, which if you go online and Google it, they haven't announced the name yet, but the, the plans and the diagrams from the architect are all on the website. Um, and it looks fantastic. For us, I think it's going to be amazing because the hardest thing about things like the Spirit of Speyside Festival is getting people to come from Dufftown, yeah. where you can pretty much walk from distillery to distillery to come all the way 30 miles south to visit us. And there's nothing else around us for them to visit to make a day of it. So if there's another distillery on the way, um, and one that is being built from scratch, so it'll have all. The, I'm sure it'll have all the great visitor experience. I think it's about two years in the build, so it'll be a while before you see any whiskey from it. But but I think they are ready to start on it now. So I just saw the chat. I think it's granted upon spay. Yeah, it's yeah. it's going to be yeah. the closest distillery to ours, and again, yeah. quite a bit further south than 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 all the others. So we're sitting in between us and the the Duff Town and you know, the Dufftown guys, so. Oh, or the Dufftown, sorry. But, but um, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on up there. Uh, hopefully it hasn't all been delayed by too much by what's been happening. But uh, anybody else? Oh, who's asking capacity? 600,000 a year, yes, bang on. Um, we currently work five, well, when we work, we work five days a week. If they did, uh, if they did seven day production, they could do a million, probably. We've never tried it. Okay, what else? Any more questions? No, thank you. Thank you, guys. 
Um, well, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you, we managed to get you on. Um, and you've certainly made my Friday afternoon. And uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's great to these things. I hope that when we all we all get to work physically again, we can still do some of these online things. Yeah, I think that. I mean, one of the things, one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, we, we we as a whiskey club, we love getting together. We do it once a month. Um, you know, there's usually 25, 30 of us get together. Somebody like you or Shelton or or, or whoever, or sometimes we just do it ourselves. Um, and and it's, it's it's always a great night. And and I, I can't wait to get back to that because I think we all we actually all miss each other. And part of the, the part of getting people together to. Uh, decant and pack boxes. It's been all the folk from the whiskey club that have got Absolutely. together to do that rather than drink whiskey. Um, I tell you, the, the first the first festival that we're all that we're all able to hit in person is going to be an old, old mighty party, I think. Yeah, but I think we're, maybe what we try to do, and we can try it out if it works. It what it doesn't. Uh, it works. It was. We will, doesn't. We doesn't. Well, um, is is have a physical, you know, get together for everybody in Southport and, and round about, and then the next night do a do an online. Yeah, but he's not in town um, because we, we, what I'm finding with the Southport Club is we're actually reaching people all across the country, and and assuming they all we, they all want to still be involved, um, then you know we should we should we should let them join in too. Absolutely, and I mean everybody being in their own little. I mean you you get a, a view of my man cave behind me, but everybody being sort of locked away these virtual things have sort of kept us all, I think they've kept, certainly kept me, well, more sane than normal. Uh, until, you know, Sh Shilton's dancing videos have sort of lit up my lockdown. <laughs> I've enjoyed that too. If you don't follow Shilton on it, if you don't follow Shilton on Instagram, please do. 